these are angel investments that a small firm of mine is making. But, but I've been sort of a startup <coughs> person myself, but probably I'm more known for some of the folks that worked for me that have gone on and, and had successes with startups. And really what I've had good luck with is backing other entrepreneurs. And so uh, this is a little bit of a discussion about what I'm looking for with the angel investments that, that, that I'm making. And this, I'm going to give a warning, this is not the normal philosophy, I think, for angel investing. So I'm going to take sort of risks and perspectives that hmm, probably would not be considered uh, common here in Silicon Valley, okay, even though I'm of and from this place. Um, so uh, hard yakka. Hard yakka means uh, hard work in, in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard that for so many years. So, so I've, I've been, you know, residents in many countries, kicked out of a few, but, but I like that word. Um, and these are, these are a bunch of different companies. Some of these are, are real startups. Some of these are better known. Uh, they're all in what we call the exchange space, which is basically matching seekers and providers, whether for goods, services, or information. And we'll talk a little bit more about my background. I've spent time, everything from a bike messenger to working at the Federal Reserve in the payments area, but I'm always interested in exchanges. What's the most efficient and equitable way to meet someone who's seeking something and someone who's providing? And so I'm always looking to invest in firms that are excellent in that space. So that's a focus uh, that I bring to everything I'm looking at. Okay, so first rule is it's better to be lucky than smart. So I've learned this through being lucky. Um, the second rule is that there's, there's really no second rule. It's always better to be lucky. <laughs> so, so what, what does it mean to be lucky and how do, you, how do you get lucky? How can you maximize your chance to be lucky? Because I'm going to be very honest, I've been very lucky um, and have been sort of in the right place at the right time like too often to, uh, to, to think of it as anything other than just really good luck in some way. But I will boil it down to, to, to one distinction. And this is, a, I want to spend a little time on this, uh, especially just given the, the nuances of the English language and all the different languages that are in this room. And the thing that I'm always looking for is, is what I call an insight. I'm looking for this in, on the lips or in the eyes of the entrepreneurs or the coders or the, 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 the people that I'm meeting, wherever I'm meeting them in the world. And I want to contrast that versus an idea. And so some definitions, an, an idea, is it's a thought or a conception that exists in the mind uh, as a product of mental activity. So it's a very sort of logical, um, mental process. And an and insight is the act or result of apprehending the inner nature of things or seeing intuitively. And this is something that comes more from the gut or the heart. It, it's almost more of like a I don't want to make it sound like it's an Eastern thing versus a Western thing, but it's, it's a different kind of feeling about an opportunity or a way of seeing the world. And, and I want to give an example. So, so these guys here, these guys, they're really who these guys are, right? This is Spock and, and Kirk, two, two of the great partners. Of them. Now, now, Mr. Spock over here, he's Mr. Logic. He's like a brainiac. He, he always has like the correct factual understanding. But, but he's not the guy in charge. Right? He, he's like a good guy. He, he's like, you know, he's important in Star Trek. But, but Kirk over here, he's the guy with the intuitive insight. He, he's the guy with the sense of something sort of like from the gut or the heart. The two of them together are a great team. Right? But when you're looking for the leader, I, I'm looking for the intuitive insight. Now, oftentimes, there's a number two that has great technical capability. And so a lot of times I find, or the successes I've had, has usually been because someone else has been filling in for me, because it's very hard to find someone who has both of these all in one person. But two people together, like, and you can think about some of the other great companies in history that often have these duo of people. One type usually gets the top billing, the other gal or person may not, but if you really look at the history of these start-offs, it's very rarely 
that you find these two things in, in one head. It happens, but we'll take a look. That guy is probably not the technologist. He's not the guy that's going to like come up with some new Cassandra database or technology whizzy whoop. But he's a guy who has the feeling and is really seeing things out there in a way that's from the gut. Now I'm going to talk about some of the clutter and stuff you have to get through to get to these great insights and, and how much how many barriers there are between what is a great insight and actually having a great company. And so I'm going to just give some examples about the path you have to go through sometimes to get to one of these. Now this is a, this is a, this was written on a paper written by a student who had an idea. He wrote up his idea when he was in school in a class that covered business concepts. But he got a very bad grade on this paper. In fact, the professor wrote, the concept is interesting and well-formed, but in order to earn higher than a C minus, it must be feasible. So the professor told him, you know, your idea is not feasible. And his name was Fred Smith. Does, does anybody know who Fred Smith was? What his idea was? Well, his idea was FedEx. <laughs> his idea was you could actually fly things overnight to like a hub, have all the planes fly and fly back, and that people would pay $25 to get something delivered, when at the time for U.S. Postal, for a couple days delivered was 25 cents. So it was 100 times as expensive. And so the professor said this idea was unfeasible. But, but it was an insight that there was a range of goods and services in the world where people really would pay for a guaranteed 10 a.m. delivery the next morning. And, and fortunately for him, he came from a fairly well-to-do family like Mitt Romney. And so he was able to borrow $70 million from his family and <laughs> put that original set of planes together. But for a long time, it looked, looked pretty bad. But that's how FedEx got started. So he was not discouraged by the fact that he earned a C- minus on his paper. When he was now, now, here's another. This is, this is a bicycle messenger. Now, now, you guys may not notice all these different things about this. This is a single-speed bike with no brakes. There's a, a lot of tattoos and uh, usually a lot of uh, bad, bad body piercings and stuff. So, so this is part of the culture here of, of the United States. And I, I have to know, I sort of come from this culture. I'm, I'm, I'm a biker. I'm a pretty bad bike messenger. But they have a particular way of looking at the world. And a bunch of things have come from them for which I am very thankful. And these bike messengers. They kind of look like this, and, 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 they, and they, behave, they behave very badly. Um, I'm not sure if you, do you guys have bike messengers? I'm not sure in all these different countries. So they, they really, they're yeah. very bad on the they rules. They do it in Dublin, too, and I like They do it, yeah. in, so they're very bad. And uh, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> this, this, they're bad. Yeah. This is not a rule-based group. Yeah. The rules are for fools group. And, and a lot of people think of these bike messengers as, uh, as anarchists. Right? They're very hard to control. And yet, they're carrying some of the most important documents from A to B that you could imagine. In fact, you guys know how we caught Osama bin Laden, right? If you want to find out where a guy's hiding who's not using computers anymore, you follow all the couriers. Following the couriers that determine the location of Osama bin Laden. So, you want to know what's moving, being moved confidentially between people about the most important thing? It's in the bags of those couriers. And the question is, how do you pick and choose which jobs to assign to which messenger? So if you're going to run a company that tries to manage all these people, these, 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 these inmates in the asylum, how do you keep a lid on them so that they're not out of control? Now, that is one way to ask the question. Now, when I was on some assignment for Booz Allen in some faraway countries, it's called New Zealand. I thought when I saw bike messengers that that was the question that was being asked and everybody was trying to answer that question. But I learned that that was a dispatcher's perspective or what I call a speaker's perspective. That's the person who's like sitting in the office trying to like through radios and phones and pagers keep track of all these people. He like is trying to be in control. But there's another perspective. This is what I would call an insight, which is to ask the question, how do messengers call for the jobs that they want to do? 
So instead of having a speaker's perspective or a doctor's perspective, this is what's called a messenger's perspective or a, listen, a listener's perspective. It's a bottom-up view of the world. And so the question is, even though these guys are like anarchists, what might the world work like if you ran things bottom up rather than top down? Because when I took a peek around the world, I saw that everything was pretty much top down, except in one or two countries, in one or two firms. In New Zealand, they were doing it bottom up. And the reason I was in New Zealand is New Zealand has no float in their banking system, because they clear every check in the country intraday. So they have a floatless system, which vastly simplifies their clearing system. And they had a very efficient courier system for getting this done. And so I stumbled across the courier system while I was there restructuring the banking system in the wake of the Thatcher reforms. I got more interested in the bikes than I did in the banks. And uh, there were some objections. This is like the inmates running the asylum. If you let the couriers decide, won't they either be greedy and call for everything or lazy and call for nothing? Number two is like, you're going to give these guys and let them, like with radios, two-way pagers, you're going to let them bid with those devices as opposed to being sort of like merely the recipients of orders? And like, how are you going to like clear and settle? Like, ultimately, all the customers have to get charged, all the couriers have to get paid, and this is really like an auction system, and you're going to have to do clearing and settlement just like in a stock exchange at the end of the day. These were all problems. And you know, I left that cushy consulting work, and I said, you know, what if we take those people and turn them into like a crew like this that actually takes responsibility, works bottom up, works with a new set of software that's built around auctioning rather than assigning work, and uses radios and now this new thing called two-way pagers, these 140 characters, because you've got to get all this information in 140 characters. So you've got to learn how to put enough information out there in 140 characters so couriers, a whole fleet of couriers in a city, can figure out which courier wants to do that job. And then you've got to clear all the money. Now, this company, like 10 messengers in New Zealand, and the software that was created to make this free call reality happen, spread from New Zealand and ended up from Perth to London with a group of 6,000 workers in seven years. We skipped venture capital, did a direct raise on the NASDAQ, like back when like 70 million was like something to raise, and uh, had a run rate of $225 million a year. We ended up licensing the software first, but then finding that the firms that used it were so much more productive that Wall Street would give us the money to go out and buy. So it, 18 months, we've purchased 62 companies across the world. And uh, this was the company that I did as the chairman. And uh, started with those bike messengers. And it all went wrong. It was like great until we went public. And then the suits came in. And you had the suits. The suits are business people. Like, like Nobody's like wearing a suit today. <laughs> but, but now you've combined it with all these bike messengers and other types of motor, like we had 500 motorcycle couriers in London, and, uh, and a bunch of entrepreneurs that ran all these companies that don't like the suits. You know. And so you have this huge culture, and it was fine when you're providing a licensing system that everybody used, but when you got a boss, and I ain't a very good boss, it ain't no fun anymore. Everybody's working for the man. And when you put on top of that, with Russia defaulting on its debts in 1998, making borrowing money expensive for everyone, and you have a whole bunch of deals in the pipeline with borrowed money, then all your costs of all your acquisitions in real dollars suddenly doubles, and all those acquisitions that were creative suddenly become diluted. And uh, then there's this thing called the internet coming along, and people don't really need that couriers anyways. You know? and, and on top of that, courier firm guys are like, when you say, hey, why don't we start dispatching like taxis? They're not going away, and police, and they're like, Dude, we're couriers, man. I said, like, and I'm like, the chairman, I'm saying, I didn't call it courier management systems. I called it dispatch management systems. We don't have to just dispatch for these packages that are going away. We can dispatch anything. They're like, no, no, that's, that's not our business. And, you know, by the time you go public, you don't really own very much of these companies anymore. So you bugger off. You take one or two coders with you. 
and you just say, screw you, I'm going off to this thing called the internet, and I'm going to start all over, and you guys can have the company. And maybe that wasn't the most mature thing, but I'm kind of glad I'm out of the messenger business, because there were other things to do. And sometimes taking one or two coders with you and leaving behind a big company, it can lead to all sorts of things. Now, I'm going to skip a couple of these pages. Uh, these, these are some other stories of like frustrating things that happened. That one I just skipped, I'm just going to tell you, that was the guy that did the high jump and he jumped over the pole backwards instead of forwards. Do you guys know this guy? Yeah. His name was Dick Bosbury. He was, a, he was a high school student. He couldn't make the track team and uh, couldn't jump over five feet. So he decided, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to try jumping over it backwards. And uh, he went on to win the gold medal in the Olympics in 1968 and changed the way the they did call it the Fosbury Flop. They did call it the Fosbury Flop. Yeah, everybody made fun of him because he jumped over it backwards and stuff. But just because people were making fun of him, he went on. So here's another guy. This guy, this guy, he's a, isn't that a frumpy looking guy? I mean, that guy, he is, uh, guess what country he's from, from that thing? He is Russian. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and what, do you, what do you think he majored in in school? Right. Math. Now, how, what? <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Now, he wrote this paper on diffusion. And uh, this is the method of edge waves and physical theory of diffraction. Now, what, what does this mean? It's like when you shine a light on something and there's a shadow behind it, the shadow isn't like just a straight black and white. There's a fuzzy zone because light kind of like bends. Around. Light is both a particle and a wave. So this is all very theoretical. And he thought that this could be applied to all sorts of things, this, this, this theory of diffraction. So he published this whole thing. And the Soviet Academy, they're like, it was like what are we going to do with this? this? This is useless. This is like too theoretical. He's like, well, can I publish the paper? He's like, of course you can publish the paper. It's, it's useless. Now, he published this paper. And the Americans read this paper. And they're like, wow. This like, this, like, this is an interesting thing. I said, what, what, what if we did, we're doing this with sound, too? And so they, they took this thing, they took this theory, and uh, they built this little model airplane. And they, they put it on, on the stack, and they took it into the computer, into the, into the, wind uh, to the radar tunnel, room, where they see what the radar is, the, the print that you have coming back. And they, they wanted to see how much that made the radar bend around this thing and, and go off. And, and the guys running the test, it went, it, it's fallen off the stamp because there's no radar reading. And they looked in there, and they're like, ooh, it's still on the stamp. And so what that meant was we just had invented stealth. right? And that is how the Americans came up with the whole generation of stealth that, that completely made all the Soviet defenses untenable because these planes are slow. They're not very stable. But you cannot see them with radar. And the whole ability for this to happen was because of the insight of this Russian mathematician who put it out there because people at the time didn't think his insight was very valuable. Okay. And that really changed the balance of what you invested in throughout the Cold War. It made the Cold War essentially too expensive to fight and to retool when you had to deal with stuff. So insights are often ignored. Okay. So they're either ridiculed, they're ignored, Insights sometimes are, are really, really simple. Now, this, this, is, this is one, this is a path that this is called the method for node ranking in a linked database. This also was contributed by another folks from over on your guys' side of the world. Um, and this was done at Stanford. And does, it, does anybody know what this, this patent is for? Google. This is the patent behind it's not, it, it. Google has it, but it, what, what, what's the patent for? The patent is for page rank. Now, Page rank is the way Google organizes its search results. Now, it sounds like, well, it must be very mathematically sophisticated. Well, actually, does anybody know how page rank works? Page rank is good. It's like democracy. It's based on voting. It says which web page has the most web pages linked to it, pointing to it, because every link is a vote. Well, how much is that vote worth? It says, well, it depends on how many links that page has pointing to it. So if your page has a lot of links pointing to it, if your page has two pointing to it and you point to another page, then that page gets two because it's, so it's an iterative process of just keeping track 
of how all the pages on the internet point to each other. And so the page that has the most links to it is the most authoritative page on a subject. So rather than the frequency of word use or, or other sorts of mathematical, it's very simple. You just count who has the most votes, they win, they go to the top of the list. And they got a patent for that, and that's what Google's been based on every, ever since. And that insight that all these other mathematically complex ways of doing search could be trumped by simply counting the votes was, was really a great insight. And it's really been a pretty unbeatable algorithm in the market for the last 10 to 15 years. And uh, so there was, this is this voting system where you just keep track of who gets the most votes. See, because this guy voted for this guy, and this guy votes for this, this guy gets more votes. Sergey and Brandon. Sergey and Brandon. Larry. So those are all a couple of them. The other thing is, I, I have learned that I, I will never have an insight because I finished school. And, and, and almost anybody who finished school, it's not completely true, is incapable of an insight because they beat it out of you. Okay? So here's some other people that are dropouts. This guy, who's this guy? This guy, Steve Jobs. His insight was, this may sound really trite, was computers could be personal. Now, we kind of take that for granted, but at the time, nobody thought that a computer was personal. That was, he was the first guy to, to think that and really stick with that. He had to like drop out of Reed College to come up with that insight. This guy, super geek. One operating system for all PC, he had to drop out of Harvard. You know, before then, if you remember, or your, your parents told you, that. Everybody was trying to make an operating system for each computer. DEC had its operating, everybody had their own operating system. Wang had its operating system. Nobody had the concept of one operating system for all the computers. This guy, people are willing to share. You know, it, it sounds really trite, but, but like, he was an ape. I was like hanging around that place when he was around. And, and he was like, dude, you know, like, people will give you all this data. That they're just willing to share. And everybody thinks that everybody wants to be a, a dog or anonymous on the internet. No, man, they'll give, you, they'll give you the goods. It was a really big, really simple insight. And this last guy, does anybody know who this guy is? Uh, this guy was in that bike messenger picture. He hacked into my system when I was doing the damn bike, bike messenger thing. This guy was in that picture. See, so you didn't pay attention to the early part of the piece of fiction. He was there. He had this insight. Beyond the insight that I stole from one of the other bike messengers about free call, he said if free call <coughs> for couriers to follow and do the jobs they want, why not freedom for anyone to follow who they want? Just generalize. Instead of just following the jobs that are dispatched, why not for any message that's thrown out there, just follow that? <laughs> and this guy, I'm just going to let him talk in his own words. This is, so this simple insight, you know, when we were at Dispatch Management Services, Jack messed around with us back in 2000 when we were still doing the messenger stuff. And uh, you know, in 2006, we had this further conversation. And, uh, you know, we both took time off between then. You know, this is when I went off to work for the Federal Reserve in payments. And, um, Jack became a massage therapist. Um, people don't know that about the time of Twitter. And uh, he came out, he was actually helping me. I had a, had a baby and we were like, he was like the nanny, he was like super nanny because you know, my uh, partner was off being a doctor and we were, we were a bunch of bums. And Jack and I would have these conversations and, and, and Jack came up with this idea and I said, you know, Jack, um, I, I think we've got to pay for those text messages. I don't think that's changed from back in the day. He says, hey, what are we going to do about that? He says, I don't know. I said, well, that's okay. I'm glad we got that settled. So uh, you know, we didn't worry about it. We just did this with text messages. And in 2006, what that meant was Facebook already had a big jump. But because of the penetration of mobile, it meant that when we launched Twitter, which there was no app at the time. There was no smartphones then. There was no app that we actually built to run on mobile phones. It just worked with SMS. It just meant that the reach of Twitter, both for sending and receiving, 
was every phone that could receive or send a text message in the world. So the initial footprint right out of the box was really greater than, than the internet because there were more mobile phones already then than personal computers. Um, and, and so that really laid a foundation for a very fast and explosive growth of Twitter. And the key insight was we went from dispatching jobs to every messenger and let them bid for who would do the work to or those jobs and bid and do the work to simply tweets to everyone and letting the people follow who they wanted to follow, to listen to which tweets they wanted to listen to. So once again, it's a listener's world rather than a speaker's world. The big insight was that people talk about freedom of speech. Well, a madman can have freedom of speech in his cell, or a prisoner can have freedom of speech. But if there's no one to listen, your speech doesn't do you much good. Freedom of speech is really about the listener, about the listener getting to choose who they want to listen to. And, and that's really a different proposition than a social network. People talk about Twitter being a social network. Eh, it's not the way we thought about it. It really is really a communication network and really a listener's network that deals with spam. Because anybody who's spamming stuff out, nobody's going to listen to it on Twitter. You don't get anywhere from telling people or forcing people to try to listen to something you're saying. You must reverse it. You must have a listener's view, just like the free call system we had for the messenger deliveries. And it's a listener's world. And that's the real insight behind Twitter. And so that simple insight has had all sorts of things that have pleased us beyond just the business side of things. It was voted this last year the most social impact in the world for a startup. It's running at 500,000 new users per day. That, that, that's the rate of growth for, for Twitter. The last valuation, 8 billion, 800 million of that was raised from the Russians, 300 million from the Saudis. Most of the money has come not from the US. In fact, when we went around for Twitter in the beginning, nobody in the Silicon Valley, no, back to why? What's the technology behind Twitter? It's low tech, there's no particular technology behind it. So why are you gonna have any sort of advantage? They didn't see it as a technology company because the insight wasn't a technology insight. It was a social insight about it being a listener's world. The people that funded the company turned out to be New Yorkers because New Yorkers understand media. Fred Wilson, Union Square, Yorn from Spark up in Boston. And, and down the road, these, these other monies have not come from some of the traditional technology VC folks because it's really based on an insight. It's not based on a technology idea. And uh, you know, Twitter often is seen to live in the shadows of uh, Facebook. Facebook's had its own problems with uh, its revenue model and some suspect. I, I will say that last month, Twitter's mobile revenue surpassed Facebook's. So in a world moving to mobile, Twitter has always been mobile first. And uh, it's a significant event that they have actually learned how to, uh, to monetize mobile quite, quite well. Now, that company I took public way back when, you know, that was a pretty unfun experience. And so part of the reason people wonder, like, why hasn't Twitter gone public? It's like, Jack was with me when we went through that. Going public and an exit strategy, it ain't all it's cracked up to be. So the group of people there aren't like, looking for that type of exit as an end goal. And the types of investors that are going to be on board for that have got to understand that as well. So it's not your traditional wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, exit type strategy business. That's not what it's about. Now, we have time. These are some Jack actually talking. I'm going to have these. This will be in the presentation. You can look at this later. We're going to skip over these for now. But it's very important to hear Jack in his own words. Um, he has a way of looking at things that has been transformative for me and the way I'm thinking. He, Jack ain't working for me anymore. I'm working for Jack these days. Um, and uh, so a lot of folks. Now, now, Twitter was the first act. Like me, we got kind of like tossed out of our own companies. So I, I don't know if you know, but Jack essentially got you know, thrown out of Twitter. And you know I was working there a bit too, so I, I left with Jack. And you know it was really not any sort of evil type thing. It's just Ev Williams, who's also very competent, who's the founder of Blogger, consultant to Google, basically sort of the inventor of blogging, had a bigger stake in the company because he put up the money. And when it got interesting, he wanted to run it, and also he had more experience than Jack. Jack was probably too much like me, trying to do too many things at once, and so got pushed out. It happens. Founders disputes happen all the time. 
but he was still chairman. He just wasn't in an operating role. Didn't get sour grapes, didn't say bad things about the company, didn't say bad things about the founder. Everybody took the high road. Went off, what did Jack do? He went off, he did goodwill missions. He went to Russia, he went to Afghanistan, he went to Iraq, he went to Mexico, and he helped people understand how Twitter could be used to like reveal corruption and violence in countries where you couldn't trust the authorities to do something about it. So that's where that whole social mission of Twitter began to get amplified. Um, he also teamed back up with his old bosses, me, and even a guy that was uh, before me, when Jack was like 15 or 16, working at like a CD-ROM firm. The guy was a glass blower. This guy, Jim, was like a real crank from St. Louis. He built faucets out of glass that cost $3,000, and you can see the poops in your toilet going through. I don't know why people would buy this thing, but people <laughs> want this stuff. And Jim lost a sale. And someone from South America wanted to buy something as they were going out the country, and all they had was an American Express card. And Jim could not take that payment because he was an artist. He's like, what am I going to do with an American Express card? So he was pissed off. Right? And so talking about this led to a dinner at Muir Beach, which is up here at the Pelican Inn, with Jack, Jim, and me. And uh, what happened at this dinner? Well, Jim talked about his problem. And if you ever meet Jim McClevey, he's passionate about his problems. Now, Jack doesn't talk a lot, or at least didn't back then. Jack stuttered when I met him. In fact, uh, when you look at him and his very deliberate speech, that's because he's had coaching to deal with his stutter. He was very shy when we first met him. But when he does talk, he asks questions. And he asks very simple questions. Um, and uh, I was there at the table as the expert. They had asked me to come partly because of my background with consulting and banking and financial services, but because also I worked at the Fed in the payments group where we run the check clearing system, the electronic transfer systems, both the wire transfer and the ACH system, and basically the cash vaults. We basically run the money for the United States. It's a small group of nine of us who are the senior analysts to figure out what the public and economic policy should be for the rest of the country. <coughs> so this is, uh, this is this buddhist -y kind of stuff. And I'm not one of these Eastern airy fairy guys, but this is this concept of the beginner's mind. It's something that Steve Jobs talked a lot about. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are very few. And unfortunately for me, I'm the punching bag. I actually was the patsy who's the expert in this regard at the table to answer these questions, these many questions from the beginner's mind. These are questions that happened that night that came from Jack. Very simple questions. They're, they're very sort of zen-like questions, and yet talking about financial services. Jack asked, why are there many ways to pay, but few ways to be paid? It's, it's like a riddle. And you know, if you think about it, you, know, you have all these different ways to check, credit cards, etc. And, uh, but you know, people that take payments can pretty much take cash or a, a check. How many people can make a payment versus take a payment? And I sort of explained there's 200 million people in the US with credit cards and 6 million institutions that can take credit card payments. And Jack asked, like, well, what do the other 94 million people do? And he said, well, you know, what's the size of the online versus offline? He says, well, PayPal, it's a big company. He says, well, how much of the market do they serve? He says, well, they do all this online stuff. He says, well, how much of commerce is online? He says, well, you know, it's, 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 it's big. It's great. He says, well, how much? He says, well, it's about 6%. He says, well, what about the other 94%? And I'm like, oh, that's an interesting one. And um, this is an interesting one. He actually asked it this way. He says, you know, at this point, he, he touched me on the wrist. He says, you know, Greg, Payments are very intimate. And in all my time at the Fed, nobody had ever to me said payments are intimate. And I'm like, well, what, what, what? I said, well, what do you mean by this? Well, you, know, you don't pay someone unless you trust them. And, and, and he sort of made the analogy of the sex thing. It's like sex between strangers, you need a condom. Sex between like people that are like married or know each other, it's like you don't have to worry about all this trust issues. And his observation was the whole payment system is based on the fact that like Visa is there because you don't trust the person who's paying. You need an authorization system to make sure that the payment can be trusted. And all the 
interchange and all the rates, everything is based around the fact that the parties are strangers and they don't trust each other. And Jack's observation was most of the time payments are between people that absolutely know each other, that intimately know each other. You, you often make purchases at the same place again. Everybody knows each other. So why is the whole payments experience based around a lack of trust rather than the fact that the dominant experience is trust? And so the result of this was this idea for Square. The idea that will enable anybody to take a payment, not just the few institutions, the six million, but anybody can take a credit card payment. That uh, you don't need a credit check to get that. that. Phones are great indicators of identity. They have GPS. We have all sorts of things that are powerful in a phone that aren't there in a car. And that that can be a platform for taking a payment rather than making it. So just remember the speaker versus the listener's world. So most people think of the world in terms of like making a payment. Most of these payment innovations in the world are about making a payment. Square is not, it's about taking a payment. And a couple years into this, three years into it, two million signups. We just broke 10 billion in annual sales. Moving from mom and pops, you've heard Starbucks launched a couple weeks ago in Canada. Japan is next. The teams are forming for international rollout throughout the world. And I can't say too much, but there's more to come. There's always lots of good surprises coming out of the world of Square in a very crowded, busy, competitive market. So these are a couple of the companies, from DMS to Twitter to Square. I've been really lucky um, to, to get to be a part of these things. I'm not the guy that came up with the insight for any of them. I just happened to have been around and have been magnetically attracted to the people that have these insights. And, and did put some money in early on. Um, you know, the company I worked hardest on, you know, I consider it a failure. Even though I went an IPO, did all these different things, it's all broken up now and sold off in pieces. It's, it's just like history. Yeah, but I hired Jack, and I kept listening to him. And uh, you know, I invested in and worked at Twitter and advice at Square. And uh, you know, just to give you a feel for this, I've risked spending time on this, another one of Jack's ideas. One of other Jack's ideas that we had, really insights, was he was watching people search on Google and he hacked the browser so that whatever you were searching for on Google, you could see who else was searching for the same thing on Google at the same time. He just hacked that so you could see that other person and you could even see what they picked from their choices on Google, and you could even talk to that person. Because people that are searching said, you know, why do you have to go through companies and websites? Why can't you just talk directly to the people that are seeking and providing? Why are all these exchanges that we have in the world have to go up through all these layers? Why can't you just connect people directly? So this company I'm working on now, FreeTap says, can't you take all the postings for seeking and providing and put them in one big pot? And all the people that have all those postings, they don't like that so much. But you know, we think those exchange, op exchange offers are out there in public, and so uh, we think they're fair game. So what does this mean when uh, we start to ask a whole bunch of questions? These are the kind of questions. Are public facts, public property? Who owns this content? Do you have to ask permission? What's the open web? What do you do when terms of uses are so abusive that you think they become unenforceable. You just look at that and says you can't take the data. We're like, that's a terrible terms of use. Huh? Rules are for fools, like those bike messengers. Well, you start doing things. And all these companies we did, Twitter, we get sued all the time. Square, we get sued all the time. And Craigslist now, I'm getting sued all the time. So these things, <coughs> with Twitter, we broke all the rules for the phone companies. You know, Peyton Manning throws a touchdown. We throttle the phone networks. They're like, you can't do that. We're like, sorry, man. Just, Twitter just lit up. You know, we're sending you these messages. Deal with it. You know, the, the banks like, you can't aggregate transactions for all these small merchants. You know, like, PayPal did. You know, we're, well, they were transformed. It. Well, we're transformed. Well, what makes you transform? We're going to put this little thing on the top of the, the phone. This little dongle. We're transformative. Okay. And uh, this thing. Padmapper, this app, these apps that let you search for apartments across all the sources. I don't think that's a crime. I think you ought to be able to search across all the different sources of data. But you know, other people don't like that. So get used to it. You're going to get sued if you're going to be disruptive. 
and you're going to be insightful and you're really going to try to shake the world up. No. A lot of VCs don't want to deal with stuff where you're going to have this kind of litigation. So, do you want to be lucky with insights? So these are kind of my takeaways. Cut through all this different stuff we've seen today. Keep it simple. Just one thing to start. Just like that guy with the one finger. You have to be the judge of what's feasible. Now this is really talking to the, to the guy that's starting the company. And you who are backing this person, you have to look and say, is that really going to get from there to the moon and back? You've got to make that assessment. Is it possible? Is it feasible? Okay. Like when we did that dongle thing in the top of Square, we're like, do we really think we can make this work? Because there's no power in that top port. We had to pull power off of that. We make that thing work not by reading the strike. It listens to the noise and figures out the number. We took some risks on that. <coughs> All right, so we have a lot of failures. There's a lot of dry holes. But we treat that as learning. You don't crucify people when some of these things crash. And We've had a lot of failures along the way. OK, all the good guys, they all dropped out of school. So don't let school get in the way of an education. And again, my, my real takeaway here is focus on insights, not ideas, not just ideas. And, and the last thing is you better have a thick skin, because don't be surprised if you're going to ruffle a few feathers and get sued or hurt some enemies along the way. Okay. So, that's it. That's just a perspective. So we've only got a couple of minutes, but if anyone's got any questions, um, because we'll have to then wind up. Because some people need to go. That's and fine. Talk to me. And, and I'll be around for a bit. Questions? Sure. So how much of um, an investor's ability to recognize that insight has to do with how the entrepreneur is able to present it, in your experience? Well, the... Um, the entrepreneur must be able to present. Both Twitter and Square, the versions that we showed or worked with, were both built in a week to demonstrate the concept. And so if the entrepreneur can't show you something that, like, you get it, it it's probably not crisp and clean. So, so the ability to show, like there's a rule, both like at Twitter, is never talk about what you're going to do. Just here it is. This, in and of itself, demonstrates the insight. So for, for Square, we made it so that we could take the credit card details, give it real-time authorization to prove that a smartphone could do a credit card authorization. Mm -hmm. And we had that up and running within a week. Mm -hmm. and it, we didn't have the whole back end. The back end, we dumped it all out. We re-entered it. We ran it through Gla Jim's Glass account. So I didn't even know where these transactions were coming from. But the, the user experience, was immediately, and, and Coastal is the one, we went and asked for 20 million. He said, I'm not going to give you 20 million. We're like, oh, I'm going to give you 40 million. Okay. Because he could see it, and, and it, 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 it was there right away. And so the entrepreneur, the, the, the guy, ought to be able to beautifully, eloquently communicate that. Because that person, that Captain Kirk, they're going to have to lead the vision. They don't have to be the technologists. Technologists, he might be over there. It's a, Jack, Jack has that ability. He went from being the geek to being, he's one of the few guys that made the transition from being thought of as Spock to now being a person who has the gut instinct as well. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately we're going to finish now. Okay. Thank you so much.